On behalf of Dean Amber Miller and colleagues across USC Dornsife and alumni relations, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event, exploring the roots, meaning, and legacies of the uprisings across greater Los Angeles in the wake of the verdicts in the Rodney King beating. It is hard to believe that 30 years have passed since that terrible April of 1992. It is so appropriate that the Cecil Murray Center for Community Engagement is ably represented on this panel discussion among three leading lights of our campus. The Reverend Najuma Smith Pollard, Assistant Director of Community and Public Engagement at the Murray Center, Professor Manuel Pastor, Director of the USC Dornsife Equity Research Institute, and Professor George Sanchez, Director of the Center for Diversity and Democracy. It has been my great good fortune to have interacted in numerous ways with the Reverend Cecil Chip Murray since I joined USC nearly 20 years ago. One of Reverend Murray's favorite phrases, one that encapsulates his sense of mission and service that he, his church, and his fellow congregants embody is you call, we haul. Los Angeles called in the spring of 1992. The verdicts shook us to our core. The violence challenged our spirit and into the breach, hauling to the calling, went Reverend Murray and First African American Methodist Church, working in direct spiritual, physical, and emotional response to Rodney King's own heartfelt plea, can we all get along? Though 30 years have passed, Los Angeles still calls. And it is through programs like this that we know that the call is still being answered. Thank you for being here. And now we'll hear from Reverend Cecil Chip Murray. It is a blessing to say hello and not goodbye. It is a blessing to say we have learned much and we have been lifted highly by the 1992 civil unrest. We will not repeat it. I, I, I think there will be those who would be agitators, but they won't find an audience soon because a comparison will be made with the 1992 civil unrest. And we came out of that determined no more civil unrest. We now have the capability of sitting together at the conference table. We have the obligation to say when we are not comfortable with the existing circumstances and we want to find ways to alter those circumstances. And because we are an altering society, we are a growing society. I think Los Angeles could at this moment be a source for any city that wants to examine civility. I think even our nation's capital which had representatives coming out following it. I think they grew and profited and much that they learned was applied and is applied. So America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am, as mentioned, Reverend Dr. Najuma Smith-Pollard. I'm the Assistant Director of Public and Community Engagement for the Center for Religion, Civic Culture, and the Cecil Murray Center. And I'm so excited to lead today's conversation with Mr. George Sanchez and Mr. Manuel Pastor. Uh, they will each uh, give a little more about what they do as they, as they like to share. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and kick this conversation off. Um, we are... 30 years out from the 1992 civil unrest, which as Bill Deverall shared, shook the core 
of Los Angeles and really is still shaking the core of Los Angeles as the 92, 92 unrest. Many of us still reflect upon that time, the lessons learned. There are numerous leaders, community activists, agencies that were birthed out of that season. Um, and so it was, it was like a tectonic plate shift and we're still in the shifting process. And so it's not like the time has come and gone, uh, but it has come and it has shifted and we are still moving along and learning to be a better community and a better city for it. And so thank you all for joining us. And I'd like to just start by setting a little context that the 92 unrest did not just come out of one situation or one incident but we had decades of injustice, decades of issues, and, and I'm gonna invite uh, George and, and Mr. Manuel Pastor to share a little about some of those issues that really got us to the place where the, 90, where the verdict for Rodney King's case really became the tipping point. It pushed, pushed the community over the edge, and that's what we all experienced. Um, that spring of 1992. So George, Manuel, please both of you, um, Manuel, we'll start with you. Please share with us where you were um, when the verdict was read and the unrest happened and, um, and what were your initial thoughts and feelings? And then uh, Manuel Pastor, we'll hear from you. Great, well, glad to be with you today, or at least uh, glad to be uh, commemorating this really important event in the history of our city. I was actually a professor at Occidental College at the time. And what I remember, I've had the unfortunate experience of being several times in a place where a hurricane was about to occur. And mm -hmm. right before a hurricane occurs, there's this kind of quiet, eerie moment where it's uh, silent and the wind is whistling and yet you know an explosion is about to take place. And that's what it felt like uh, when the verdict came down in the case of four police officers who had beaten uh, Rodney King. The not guilty verdict sort of rang through the city and you knew that something was going to take place. And it did. Uh, there was political protest at Parker Center, the police headquarters in uh, 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 downtown Los Angeles. There was the sort of uh, racialized violence that took place at Florence and Normandy that I know that George is going to talk about other places as well. But then it became quite clear as it spread throughout the city that while this was a protest against policing, it was also a protest against poverty. You asked about the context. The context in Los Angeles was that the Los Angeles metropolitan area had suffered fully one quarter of all the job losses that occurred in the nation during the recession of the early 1990s. And while this was a sort of general uh, devastation for the working class of Los Angeles, it hit particularly hard in the black community and it had real impact. So we were looking not just at issues around policing, but we were looking around poverty in the black community and also poverty in the Latino community. I could keep going, but George, <laughs> uh, where were, and I do wanna say that one of the things that I very much remember is mm -hmm. that in the first few days that fame, the yeah. first African Methodist Episcopalian church that Chip Murray was the head of was the place. And it was one of the places where I went yeah. to try to get my marching orders about where to help clean up, how to participate with others, what to think about what was going on. George, and, what was it like for you? Yeah. Um, I was a professor at UCLA at the time. And, uh, you know, we got an urgent call, as many of us did, uh, to come, in my case, to pick up my eight year old. Because mm -hmm. uh, schools were shutting down, uh, everything was going to curfew. And so I rushed home. Uh, uh, picked him up uh, from school, and already you could see, uh, you know, violence and and police on the streets. I lived in the mid city area, and uh, for the next uh, three or four days, uh, we were trying to protect that neighborhood. There were things on fire um, 
all around us. Uh, the kids who started uh, having school off uh, were playing outside and then couldn't be outside because of the ash that was falling from the sky. Yeah. <clears throat> um, it was a pretty powerful moment uh, for neighbors. We had uh, our local mini mart go up in flames. Um, and uh, at that time I lived in mid city, right uh, off of La Cienega, which is the border between Beverly Hills and the city of Los Angeles. So I lived in the city of Los Angeles where things were burning. Right across the street was a fire engine from Beverly Hills who would not cross the street. Um, and uh, the police in Beverly Hills were basically blocking every street uh, uh, at that time with uh, open shotguns. It was probably one of the most uh, scary moments, I think, in uh, being in Los Angeles at any, at any given point for people who lived anywhere near um, where the riot affected and it affected a lot of us. Um, I, I thought a lot about the fact that uh, there are some th issues that came out of the LA riots that we can see uh, that continued on for more, you know, uh, at least 25 years. One of them is the failure of our justice system, uh, both in terms of uh, the verdicts against, uh, uh, of not guilty against those police officers that, that beat up Rodney King, but also earlier and not uh, putting to jail um, uh, uh, the, the woman who shot and killed uh, Latasha Harland. Mm -hmm. um, so there was yet yeah, the failure of the justice system, which has continued, uh, I think, unfortunately. You had the, the role of the police uh, obviously playing a huge role. That's continued in the violence against uh, minority communities. Um, and you see, you know, all the way to uh, to more recent times that that's continued. You also had one of the first times that these sorts of phones <laughs> became right. and, and the ability to record became yeah. a huge issue in our culture yeah. uh, around uh, the filming of the beating of Rodney King. That's going to continue on for many, many years. And I think that the two issues for me that uh, come up. One is the one that Manuel mentioned, which was the, the deindustrialization of the jobs in Los Angeles led to a 24% decrease in the wages of African American men in Los Angeles in the previous 10 years. Uh, just an incredible uh, collapse of the inner city economy in all sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you had a demographic transformation yeah. In South Los Angeles, by this time in 92, it's estimated that 50% of the residents were already Latino. Um, and that, I think, created tensions that had not been discussed enough. Mm -hmm. And so on the corner of Florence and Normandy, most, most people remember the beating of, of Reginald Denny. But of course, there was over 30 other people beaten up and, and all of them, all the rest of them were uh, either Latino or Asian American. Yeah. And I and I think that for me, at least, uh, it showed that the vulnerability of immigrant populations uh, in Los Angeles, uh, the fact that they uh, could be victims of, of, of violence uh, against them, uh, that would become clear that the 1990s introduced an anti-immigrant period in the United States, in, in, in Los Angeles in particular, with Proposition 187, two years later, the Pete Wilson anti-immigrant campaign um, and uh, a whole slew of, of uh, efforts in the 1990s to really blame immigrants for what was happening uh, in that larger economy, um, mm -hmm. uh, which I think uh, what was very significant. So, so all of these things came together in a really explosive fashion. Mm -hmm. um, and it made me think uh, intellectually about the question that Rodney King asked, you know, can we get along? It led me directly to, to work on Boyle Heights as a, as a place that uh, I wanted to answer that question. I wanted to think about that question, but it also gets at South LA, Koreatown, a lot of places in Los Angeles in which people were living side by side and, as, and asking the question, are, you know, is this our fate uh, to, to engage in, in sporadic violence uh, if we are coming from different cultures and different communities? Right. Thank you for um, both of you for sharing that. I know for myself, um, I was a member at Fame at the time and singing a choir and getting my feet wet with social concerns committee, um, and just watching, as you mentioned, Manuel, all the people that flooded into Fame, not just that that day and that night, but just the days and weeks to follow. Fame really became like this twenty four 
hour a day, seven days a week machine. Um, and it was just an amazing time. But I know as driving from the, the night of the verdict, driving from fame to where I was living at the time, which was 93rd and Avalon, um, seeing just the city explode. And it was just devastating. I, mean, I was very early in my 20s. And I had never been exposed to anything like that before. And then a few days later, you know, it's tanks driving. I remember very clearly tanks driving down Broadway on the corner of Broadway and Manchester, seeing the tanks coming in to enforce curfew um, and to, to lessen violence. Uh, but at the same time, as both of you have mentioned, and, and so many of us are fully aware of, this type of thing doesn't happen out of anywhere. Um, in addition to what's also been mentioned, there were the decades where black and brown men had been experiencing police violence, but it never was recorded or it wasn't recorded in a way that it was public like it was now. Because I remember after the, after, the ver after the beating and then the verdict, other people started publishing and printing their pictures and the devastation that their brother or their son or their uncle experienced. Um, and, and so what you see is this like boiling point um, that the community comes to and it just explodes in this way. Um, and many people regret the time, but I wanna ask you both a question. Would we be where we are today without the unrest? And I'm gonna let you go first, Manuel, and then George. Would we be where we are today? And, I, and listen, I'm very clear, we have a long way to go because as been mentioned, a lot of the issues and tensions are still an issue. We've seen some change, we've seen some growth, we've seen some progress, but it's not enough. But where we, would we be where we are today without the 92 unrest? So I think the 92 unrest was a transformative moment for mm -hmm. Los Angeles in several ways. Mm -hmm. One, uh, but I'll get three because as a lapsed Catholic, everything takes place in a tree. Yeah, absolutely, uh, so, the same way. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the first is that the uh, the police violence uh, became a lot clearer to people. The fact mm -hmm. that the justice system would uh, reject this obvious evidence mm -hmm. of uh, police brutality. Um, it's, it's so I think a lot of attention finally got paid to the issues of deindustrialization, the way it was affecting black male workers in particular, the way that that had helped trigger the crack cocaine epidemic and the, the situation of police violence. And so police reform, albeit imperfect, uh, came from it. The second big thing is something that George mentioned, which is that, you know, it turned out that 51% of the people arrested were Latino. And it wasn't because Latinos were hanging around going, oh, wait a minute, I'm not going to run. Uh, mm -hmm. They ran just as much and had a bunch to fear uh, from the police who were literally taking people and handing them over to immigration authorities without uh, any attempt to protect them from mm -hmm. deportation, which had been standard police practice. But it's mm -hmm. just that the neighborhoods had transformed mm -hmm. so much that South LA, as George was mentioning, was creeping up on being uh, half Latino. And that, by the way, was a wake up call for South LA, but also for Latino political leadership in Los Angeles, who mm -hmm. realized they didn't know really any Latinos in South LA. That when they called together a press conference, they would get people from East LA, maybe from Central City and Pico Union, where there was a Central American community, but they weren't tapped into this large Latino presence at all. Yeah. But the third thing, which I think is perhaps even more fundamental than the first two, was progressive organizers realizing that if you have a city that is pissed off enough mm -hmm. about policing and inequality to burn itself down to the ground, and you have not been able to channel that into something more positive, there's not just something wrong with the system, there's something wrong with you as an organizer. Absolutely. And so we saw, of course, fame step in with mm -hmm. community and economic development programs, but a bunch of other faith-based organizations in South LA and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. We saw the emergence of living wage campaigns. Mm -hmm. We saw immigrant workers going from uh, the deprivation that led them to loot mm -hmm. to the anger 
that led them to organize. Yeah. We saw black, brown organizing. So yes. the kind of hostility that George was talking about got supplanted by a community coalition and all sorts of other organizations mm -hmm. saying, how do we build ties? And I think, I don't wanna to put too happy face of a picture on it, but I think we saw people realize that we needed to be impatient about injustice, yes. but patient about strategy in terms of building community alliances and political power to fundamentally shift of what was being delivered in the city and county of Los Angeles. Yeah, absolutely. George, any thoughts? Yeah, um, I think what I'll do is I'll go even more local and then I'll go more global. Okay. Um, uh, on a more local level, uh, I think it's very clear uh, that USC yes. uh, reacted to the to the 92 riots by doing a number of things that they hadn't done up to that point. One of them is the Neighborhood yeah. Academic Initiative, which is to take seriously trying to improve the schools right around the community. Um, with Steve Sample, uh, his leadership, uh, they enacted programs, uh, by the way, just like they had after the 1965 Watts riots, mm -hmm. that for the first time uh, kind of moved into urban uh, issues in a serious way. In mm -hmm. the wake of the 65 riots, there was the uh, Joint Education Project, JEP. There yeah. were other urban studies projects. In the wake of the 92 riots, we had the Neighborhood Academic Initiative. We had the formation of the program, then the Department of American Studies and Ethnicity that took that ethnic studies seriously. And I don't think without the 92 riots, actually, this department that I am now part of would have been formed. Yeah. Um, I think it took this kind of push to, to, uh, to make, take seriously the need to come up with new solutions, new mm -hmm. perspectives. Mm -hmm. On a more global level, um, I think Manuel's absolutely right. Los Angeles learned a tremendous amount from the 92 riots, but it didn't necessarily translate into, into that learning across the nation. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what you saw was a number of places, Arizona being one right away, now in, in the Trump, uh, with the Trump administration nationally, the anti-immigrant sentiment became weaponized. Yes. Uh, and, and that, uh, you know, became something that was more global and then happened even at a greater extent mm -hmm. um, that that didn't um, it didn't translate the the things that California or the Los Angeles learned didn't necessarily translate into national uh, a national reckoning with uh, the same sort of things and then we see of course with the George Floyd case that many of the same issues involving police and the justice system were delayed at the federal level in other places so, I do think that it's a mixed uh, bag of things with Los Angeles learning a great deal, yeah. but with uh, the nation as a whole actually not learning the lessons it might have from, from the 92 riots. Right, from dissecting and really looking at it. And I know as a pastor, one of the things that I think come, comes out of this in addition to what's been shared is faith leadership, right? Cecil Murray being at the helm um, as it relates to faith, faith leadership, faith community, leading the, you know, be taking center and leading other pastors. And so now we have in Los Angeles, um, you know, a mass organizing with faith groups of all different faith traditions, not just the black church, but, you know, people really taking um, an understanding that how important the voice of the faith community is. Um, and when it comes to these very at home, but also national issues. And so that's one of the things that comes out of that is that now we have, you know, not in this is the Murray Center, we have all of these congregations of all different kinds of faith traditions that have CDCs that are nonprofits that are actively working on all of these issues that have been raised from police reform to immigration to work wage rights and all these different things that all of this comes as a result of this huge kind of earthquake even here just in our city um, and, and for those that are watching and those that are, you know, part, participating in the conversation, viewing this and those who will watch the replay, um, part of what we want to do today is not just talk about what happened, but to understand where we are and how we got to be where we are today. And even what does this mean for the future, right? What are the future implications as we reflect 30 years 
you know, after the 1992 uh, unrest and how all of us are a part of this conversation, even individuals who don't necessarily, weren't, who did not necessarily live in LA at the time, but you're here now in the city and you're asking questions like, where did all these people come from? Where did all this activism come from? Now you have a sense of what led us to this place where you have faith leaders that are stepping up. You have the academic world that's stepping up um, and, and so on and so forth that's stepping up into the spaces around justice, around um, you know, equity. And, and even through the pandemic, we saw you know, so many groups engaged to make sure because what the, thing, the pandemic unveiled, right? It was another layer of, of uh, inequities and injustice that people were able, agencies, organizations, leaders, community activists, were able to participate in. And so I think that's important to kind of look at the whole thing and see how, how much it is change, is changing us, but how much still needs to be changed. Let me ask this other question um, of you both. It, as regards to the work that you do, uh, specifically, George and Manuel, um, how has your work been shaped and shifted? And I'll answer, of course, but how has your work, in, you know, just what you do, been shaped and shifted by the 92 unrest, but also in reflection the last 30 years. Whoever wants to, George, you go first. <laughs> sure. Um, well, in a very specific way, my, my first book had just been launched uh, uh, right before the 92 uh, unrest. And uh, part of what, what happened to me, of course, is you go out and you start speaking about your book and then everybody asks you about the 92 riots, no matter what. <laughs> my right. book ended in 1945. I'm a historian. So I decided in the wake of that to really focus on a community I knew very well because of that Rodney Quick King question. Um, mm -hmm. Can we live in communities that get along? And mm -hmm. I wanted to focus specifically on Boyle Heights. And it took me on a very long period of understanding the multiracial nature of so many communities um, in Los Angeles. But Boyle Heights was my focus. But it made me ask broader questions about multiracial communities in Southern California, places like Koreatown, like South LA, like Boyle Heights, like a number of neighborhoods. Can people actually get along? Can they do it over time? Can they do it without riots? Can they, can they work together across um, boundaries? And I think that intellectually for me was incredibly important. Uh, professionally, in terms of teaching, these became the central questions of my, of my time. So more and more my undergraduate and particularly my PhD students, these are the questions that motivate them. Mm -hmm. um, can, can we see neighborhoods yeah. that really empower individuals? How do people who don't have citizenship rights yeah. uh, feel belonging or not feel belonging mm -hmm. in the communities they land in? Um, what does it mean to have Black Latino coalitions uh, in South LA? This is the, I'm thinking of Abigail Rosas's work. Um, uh, you know, a whole bunch of questions that ended up driving an intellectual agenda um, that are about uh, race, but also about multiracial co coalitions, collaborations mm -hmm. uh, over time, historically. Yeah. Um, and that really has, has, essentially driven my career for the last period. It's driven my administrative work in American studies and ethnicity uh, at USC. And I think increasingly it drives um, some of our sense of, of a kind of racial reckoning, um, you know, all the way to the renaming of buildings at USC, like yesterday, um, you know, where we have to kind of relook at our history and say, is that what we want to commemorate or do we want to commemorate hope and things in the future that that can bring hope to a much wider range of people. Yeah, absolutely. And George, you didn't give us your book, the name of your book. Uh, it's called Boyle Heights, uh, <laughs> how a Los Angeles neighborhood uh, became uh, a symbol for American democracy. Wonderful. Thank you. Manuel, how have you were particularly reshaped or shaped out of the 92 unrest? Your well, own work that you do. I mean, it's sort of totally transformed my life. Um, academically and otherwise. Before the civil unrest, I'd been part of a organization called the New Majority Task Force, bringing together African-American, Latino, and Asian Pacific Islander, sort of civic leaders, urban planners, to talk about a different economic and social vision for Los Angeles. So there were, so it's a group of people that had pretty deep multicultural ties and multicultural 
practices that were able to come together after the unrest when everything seemed shattered and torn apart. Mm -hmm. uh, and it became quite clear to me there that the research I did actually needed to contribute substantially to change in the world. And yeah. so it's no surprise that a couple of decades later, I had a research institute called the Equity Research Institute. Yeah. Heck, equity is in the name. And our slogan, or cosigna, is data and analysis to power social change. Yeah. So since you know the unrest, so much of my research has been in alignment with community-based organizations seeking to try to transform the conditions that give rise to resentment and violence, and instead create the conditions that will give rise to empowerment and visioning and solidarity moving forward. And also embedded me deeply in working with groups in South Los Angeles. And so shameless plug for our new book too, South, <laughs> South Central Dreams, Finding Home and Building Community in South LA, which is a look at the demographic transformation of South Los Angeles from being 80% African-American in 1970 to two-thirds Latino today, and the emergence of both Black, Brown organizing in that context, and also something very interesting, place identity alongside race identity. So yeah. understanding how the pride of uh, growing up in South LA, uh, yeah gives a kind of sense of resilience to both black and brown people who grew up there, something people don't fully appreciate. So uh, that totally had a transformative effect on my life, the kind of work I do, and even apparently the kind of books I write. I love it. I love it. I, and, and, and like the both of you, uh, my life was completely transformed. And, and actually, a year and a half later, um, I accepted my call to ministry under Cecil Murray, um, and which I have continued to pastor, you know, went through the process of pastoring um, through the AME denomination. Um, but also for me, really shaping and solidifying you know, I was I was raised under uh, Second Second Baptist Church under Pastor Kilgore and Epps, who are both very strong social justice pastors, right? And so that it so being in fame at that time just affirmed and confirmed the things that they had been as a child. I had heard preached um, all throughout my life, and still Pastor Epps still preaches a very social justice ministry um, focused ministry. Um, and so out of that, and then of course you know, following Pastor Murray here at USC with the both of you oh, <laughs> and, 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 and training and then us, the team of us being engaged in training other faith leaders to do what Pastor Murray did at that time and did for many years before and after the Naya 2 on arrest um, because he set a model for faith leadership and faith engagement, um, civic engagement here in the city that we've all, you know, either been impacted by or learned lessons from. Um, and so I'm grateful for that opportunity. We also want to invite those that are watching, feel free to uh, share questions in the chat or in the Q&A box if there's any questions and we'll answer those for you. But I want to shift the conversation. Second because, Baptist know, and fame, you got some credentials. My yeah, friend. yeah. <laughs> and, and my grandfather was a lifelong NAACP uh, member. My mother was a Black Panther. It's all in my family. It's, it's in and, the DNA. <laughs> Spend a little time at home in Methodist and you're complete. Yeah, exactly. 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 And and actually Jim Lawson was one of my was was one of my direct mentors when I did the passing the math oh. program. So it really is in my DNA, this social justice work and conversation. Um, and being engaged in this way. And that's why I'm just so grateful to be here with you all and talking about this reflection the what happened to LA, how Dr. Murray and others in USC were a part and, and so many so many individuals that we wouldn't even have time to name all of the people, all of the agencies, departments that that came out of this time, right? But there's another side to this story, a couple of sides that I don't want us to overlook. And that's the narrative around black women. Um, one of the things that we ought and you mentioned it, uh, George, about Latasha Harlins, her story is often left out of the conversation around um, Rodney King and the night to unrest, but part of part of the tension was what we saw happen to Latasha Harlins and the justice system there. Um, but also, even when we looked 
30 years later, or maybe 28 years later with George Floyd, how Breonna Taylor's story was often left off the table and what led to this global movement, you know, following George Floyd. So I would just like to hear from your perspective the about the narratives of women who've experienced injustice um, and, and from your communities, you know, how, what, what are your thoughts on that? And then I have another flip I wanna talk about. <laughs> So I think it's incredibly important uh, to realize that that was a fundamental uh, part of the equation back in 92. Uh, Dr. Brenda Stevenson over at UCLA has written a wonderful book about that. My students read that book regularly. Um, and it really talks about three different communities coming together. And, mm -hmm. and it's the Korean community, the African-American community, and the Jewish community mm -hmm. um, through the through the, the judge, uh, uh, Joyce Carlin's um, you know, and, and the, the, the tensions at work in trying to seek social justice and, 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 and criminal justice in, in the court system. I think the failure of the court system um, to uh, make sure that justice is done is one of the fundamental issues for our times. Yes. Uh, it, it is one of those things that um, I think uh, people put hope in Mm -hmm. that people would be uh, convicted of crimes when they committed them, that they would be, uh, and, and over and over, I think people saw in the community that that wasn't occurring. Yes. And it wasn't occurring when it, when it happened against uh, a community youth mm -hmm. in Latasha Harlan's case, it wasn't happening when, when um, the police weren't brought to justice in, to, uh, in Breonna Taylor's case. Mm -hmm. um, and these things really fundamentally strike at the hope that people have that the systems we have in place actually work. Yes. And so, so when we see, for example, the last two weeks of, of uh, a new Supreme Court justice, a black woman coming on the Supreme Court, those are the things that give us some hope that say okay. maybe, maybe mm -hmm. as we move forward, um, we will find ways to incorporate everyone fairly into our justice system, the people who administer justice, but also the people who expect justice when they go in front of the court. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a huge issue that is Absolutely. still a question mark in so many people's minds. Yeah. What will happen as we move forward? Can um, people be treated equally in front of uh, the, the court of justice? Mm -hmm. And that's what led to that. That was part of the, that, to your point. That's the that was the fuel, if you will, to the fire was the injustice and that we people just want justice, whether that's in school, court, hospitals, people want justice. And we and and um, and that's 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 the cry of the of the unheard, which is why we end up having, you know, um, unrest is because. We've got to see justice. Emmanuel Pastor, your thoughts around the narratives around women and, and, and that issue? Well, I think what often gets eclipsed mm -hmm. uh, is the role of women in leading uh, yes. recovery and transformation. Yes. So you can't tell the Phoenix story of rising from the ashes without oh. talking about Karen Bass and Sylvia Castillo exactly. forming community coalition. Yes. You can't tell the story of the living wage without focusing in on Madeline Janus, who's a Jewish woman who helped jumpstart Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy, working a lot with immigrant workers. You can't talk about the empowerment of immigrants in Los Angeles without talking about Maria Elena Grasso and Angelica Salas and yeah. their leadership. You can't talk about the transformation of South Los Angeles without talking about Denise Fairchild and CD Tech. Uh, so I think one of the- <laughs> Name things, the role, Manuel. In the church, they say, call the role. <laughs> so, but I, but I think that the issue yeah. is that when you get to the, uh, you can't talk about the modern version of uh, anti tackling anti-racist policing with Black Lives Matter without talking about the fact that it was three black women, two Absolutely. of them in California, who yeah. form BLM, uh, who have been able to move these issues to the national forefront. Mm -hmm. So I think just like the murder of Latasha Harlan yeah. by a Korean shopkeeper who believed that she was shoplifting orange juice and just killed her uh, mm -hmm. for that, or the uh, Breonna Taylor's uh, murder also being kind of ignored 
in large part by the press, et cetera, the role of women in recovery, uh, in reimagination, in restructuring too often gets left to the floor. And that is the long, hard, patient work of rebuilding that also needs to be celebrated and put up on a pedestal. So we see the brilliant work, these women of all ethnicities, but you know, a lot of black women in the mix for sure uh, are doing. Yeah, I, um, um, Matt, uh, Eugene Williams, who was part of the, the, the Murray Center becoming what it is um, when it was, when it, when the beginning, when it was uh, passing the mantle, he was a big part of, of that program. Um, and he asked me a, a very strong question one day about women in leadership and being three-fifths of work. And he challenged me to write. So I'm gonna put a shameless plug out there for something that I wrote as it relates to empowering the village, looking at the role of women um, in social justice movements, actually starting all the way back to Queen Mother in Africa and going all the way up to the present age and how there's so many narratives. And I'm, I, we don't have time to get into it all today, but um, he, he challenged me to look deeply into that. And that's also part of why I'm in this work and I support um, so many other women in, in this work around equity and justice. Um, um, we do have a question um, from Tay. Thank you, Tay, for your question. The question is, my question has to do with both contribution and perhaps insufficiency of Korean and Asian American churches in the aftermath. What might Asian American churches today learn? Do I need to read it again? So I'm going to post No, it. no, that's fine. You okay. know, one of the things that I would say that I think is really important is to realize that the Korean American community felt abandoned during the LA civil unrest because the police withdrew in yes. a way that left a lot of their uh, uh, stores, mm -hmm. uh, quite often uh, liquor stores, but other kinds of stores too, laundromats, et cetera, quite vulnerable to uh, uh, rioters and uh, looters. And it uh, was quite interesting because the political reaction, uh, and it was on the part of some uh, yeah. Korean folks, was you know sort of anti-Black and stuff like that. But for the most part, what happened was people recognizing that they too had been abandoned by systems that yes. were supposed to serve them. Yeah. And that as a result, that what they needed to do was to step into the public sphere and that yeah. that public sphere in Los Angeles was a multicultural public sphere in which alliances needed to be formed with every group. And so I'm actually quite inspired by mm -hmm. the way in which the Korean American community responded, yeah. particularly because one of the things post unrest was that it was a big opportunity to shut down liquor stores in South yeah. LA, which had been very much a nuance. And while yeah. that could have been perceived as being anti-Korean because so many of the owners of those stores were Korean, there was a lot of work done to try to make sure that there could be an economic transition of those stores to other kinds of uh, work. And I think a new generation of Korean American activists came yeah. out of that era who were very interested in bridge building, uh, yeah. very interested in being part of this larger progressive renaissance. And that set, you know, really, I think, uh, put the seeds in place for what's been the reaction during the pandemic when yes. we saw this rise in hate crime against yes. Asian Americans. And we saw a lot of Asian American activists raising these issues and then trying to put that in the context of struggling against anti-Black racism, struggling yes. against xenophobia, often yes. directed at Latino immigrants, et cetera. So I think what could have been a very negative reaction from those circumstances actually turned out to be a positive bridge building reaction right. for the most part. And I think there's a lot that churches today could continue to do that maybe the Reverend could talk about, but I feel pretty optimistic about the way in which the Asian American community has shifted to yeah. begin to identify in a multicultural fabric. Yeah, and, and we lift up persons like Hey Pen M, who's doing a great work here in Los Angeles to help bridge those the, the communities together and continue the conversation and this work forward. I want to address one other flip because our time is winding down um, to 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 this discussion around reflecting on the ninety two unrest, and this was something that we had, we had talked about in preparing for today, and how and this is no shade on anyone who lives in the nine hundred two hundred one zip code, but one of the realities was. Beverly Hills became an armed camp. Let's talk about 
how that's problematic when we think about the larger work that has to happen in the county of Los Angeles, where communities get to or have been able to secure themselves away from other issues. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on that um, and how do we do better? Because one of the things that I've learned and what we understand is that injustice anywhere is injustice for everybody. It's, it, it's not like this neighborhood and not that neighborhood. It, it affects us all. And, and why is it problematic that a, like a city like Beverly Hills become, gets to become an armed camp when the rest of the city is burning? Well, uh, you know, let me just say that part of, uh, there, there's also a question around redlining. You know, this is the legacy, the long legacy yes. of Los Angeles's and Southern California's history, yes. which is the separation of some populations, some cities, some yeah. areas from others uh, in a mode of protection, both in terms of police forces but also in terms of school districts, mm -hmm. also in terms of, of taxes, a whole range of resources that are then um, limited yeah. uh, to very specific small communities that yeah. try to separate themselves off from the larger good. Mm -hmm. We know, and we've known for a long time that that will not work in the end. Yes. You can, you, can, um, you know, maybe uh, line up your police as Beverly Hills did on every east-west corridor uh, through Los Angeles and keep people from uh, from that day's work. But yeah. but for example, in the wake of the George Floyd incident, we realized, <laughs> no, this kind of keeps coming back to yeah. communities that feel that they are separated out. You cannot do that long term. You have to find wider metropolitan areas of justice in yeah. order for things to occur. And in a place like Southern California, where you have unincorporated communities, most yeah. of East LA, you've got cities who, who are struggling in all kinds of ways because of the, the lack of an economic um, base yeah. uh, to fuel their, their local initiatives. Uh, you've got to take a wider approach and a regional approach. There's no other way of bringing a kind of justice to, to these areas. We yeah. learned it in terms of air pollution and smog yeah. Um, and we, we need to learn it in terms of social and racial justice. It's Absolutely. not going to happen by hiding away in a given community um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and a certain tax base. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's always going to affect and always going to cross those boundary lines, no matter what we do. Right. So we got to work together. Jo uh, Manuel, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Oh, man, I have so many thoughts. On that. <laughs> um, well, you only have eight minutes. <laughs> we've, well, I've got less because I want to make sure we all talk. Um, so... I want to say that we've done a lot of research looking at the relationship between inequality, residential segregation, political fragmentation, and the ability to sustain job growth over time. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that when you've got a lot of inequality, a lot of residential segregation, and a lot of people pulling in different directions, you wind up not being able to agree on what your economic model is, not making the kind of investments in public education that are necessary to have a thriving workforce, et cetera. And so we often talk about equity as a fairness issue, but equity is also a regional prosperity issue, which is I think what George was pointing to in his comments. But I wanna point out something else, which I think is really important. When we talk about segregation, we often talk about the deleterious or negative effects on people who are the victims of segregation, or schools, uh, worse air, uh, which is being demonstrated over and over again, less access to uh, job networks or transit to get to those jobs, et cetera. We forget, forget about the deleterious impacts of segregation on the wealthy. What do right. I mean by that? When you're with a group of other privileged people, you tend to walk around thinking that you actually deserve it rather than understanding that there but for the grace of God go I. And that your good fortune is the result of your parents' good fortune and their ability to get you into better schools, that you had breaks along the way, et cetera. And you wind up creating a mythos of deserving mm -hmm. around you being wealthy instead of a myth, instead of a ethos of giving yes. and responsibility, yeah. which is what, for example, the church wants us to understand about the role that we have in the world, that to, uh, to those who much is given, much is expected. And that, you know, I think what 
it's not just that Beverly Hills can drop its drawbridges, it's right. that it can convince itself that everyone in Beverly Hills, and I don't mean to bang on Beverly Hills, I'm sure there are wonderful oh, people yes. live there as well, <laughs> uh, but that when you're in an affluent area, the yeah. ability to convince yourself that your affluence is due to your own hard work rather than to the structural conditions that have made it possible for you and your family to thrive. Yeah. You know, last word, we in the United States yes. often celebrate people who beat the odds and wow. we should, yeah, but yeah. we should be actually celebrating people who change the odds so that everyone Ooh, can that's succeed. Good. And yeah. that is what the civil unrest, I think, makes clear to us. Yeah, absolutely. I love that, man. But let, let's focus on change the odds and not just those who can beat the odds. And this whole mythos versus ethos. Um, and I'm really, I'm really digging this conversation. And I know um, as a pastor, you know, one of the things that we look at the text is the Good Samaritan and how he crossed over the other side of the road. Um, and, and, and we have to continue to cross over uh, to our neighbor um, and cannot just stay in our own neighborhood um, but we have to continue. To, if we're going to see equity, if we're going to see justice, if we're going to answer Rodney King's question, can we all get along? Then we all have to be willing to cross these bridges. Um, I, I, we're, we're wrapping up on time. Um, we had a question from Am Amalia. Um, so I'm going to ask the question, but I also want you each to share with us. Um, we talked about lasting legacies. So what's one or two lasting legacies that we pull from this time in reflection of 30 years? Um, and then I'll close out with a final thought. Um, and if, if you're interested, anyone's interested, if you go to crcc.usc.edu forward slash LA30, um, we have a full write-up about um, L, the last 30 years um, and the work that Dr. Mer's done and others in the community. Um, but the question from Amalia is, I'd love your thoughts on the potential impacts of the housing crises and inflation on community dynamics in LA. And I'm guess in, in addition to this conversation, um, housing crises and inflation. Um, so give us your response, but also lasting legacies and then we'll wrap up. George, we'll go with you. Yeah, yeah I'll start. Um... You know, one of the issues that concerns me a great deal in terms of the housing crisis is the fact that many of the children who grow up in these more affluent neighborhoods can't afford to live in that same neighborhood as they become adults. Right. And so what happens? They take a certain amount of capital and they move around to other neighborhoods where it's cheaper, where mm -hmm. there's more immigrants, where it's different, and, and they gentrify. And so part of the issue for me has to do with how Los Angeles deals with the gentrification crisis and whether it will continue to have places where working class people, newcomers, immigrants can actually live, can pay a reasonable rent, can, uh, where low income housing uh, happens. Um, and, and again, some of that same attitude sometimes gets, Manuel was talking about, gets transferred down to children thinking that they're they're, they have the only capital that, that should exist, right? Yeah. But what we often have in our communities is incredibly incredible community capital, incredible histories of communities that have come together that people have uh, struggled, but they have lived a life that allows them to prosper even in more difficult circumstances. And I worry about losing communities like that in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to have equitable housing policies. We have to have policies that allow Los Angeles to continue to be a place where working class newcomers can, can settle down and can, can live a life that allows uh, them to prosper and allows their children to prosper. Mm -hmm. In terms of a lasting legacy from the 92 riots, I wanna talk about the immigrant rights movement. Because I think one of the things that happened in 92 is a lot of these immigrants saw themselves and said, wait a second, um, we have to speak up in a way that we haven't done. And so the first uh, evidence of that are, is from those that were legalized in the 1986 Urca law. Mm -hmm. Ten years later, they become citizens and they start to vote. And they vote big time. Um, in California elections. They vote in, and basically turn the state blue. Yeah. They, they are the most consistent voters, more than Mexican-Americans, more mm -hmm. than the African-American community. They vote um, to protect 
working yeah. class, low income neighborhoods in Los Angeles. And that's really more than anything else, how things get transformed in California and Los Angeles electorally. Yeah. Moreover, those that aren't able to vote and become citizens begin to say, we have to speak out. And it's often the children in those families. So yeah. when they have the immigrant rights marches of 2001, 2002, that are speaking up against legislation that was being considered by Congress, you have the children in those same immigrant families saying, enough is enough. Absolutely. Quit attacking my parents, quit attacking my community. We're gonna speak up. And this is where you have Latinos, you have Asian Americans, you have a whole bunch of different groups coming together with African Americans, with yeah. whites of Los Angeles to say, do not use immigrants as scapegoats. Absolutely. Um, and this is the, the biggest marches in, in Los Angeles history. So I think the immigrants' rights marches that have continued and, and the speaking up of even an undocumented population is a critical legacy that I think has transformed what democracy is yeah. in Southern California. What it is very basically, it's, it's not necessarily an electoral democracy, but it's a democracy that communities matter and that the people, the residents of those communities matter and they should express themselves politically. Absolutely, wonderful. Manuel Pastor? Um, George said plenty about gentrification and for reasons of time, I'll just focus in on legacy. And I think uh, two bits of legacy and one hope for legacy. One fascinating legacy is from the neighborhood academic initiative that George was talking about. Each year at USC, the number one or number two sending school is Fauché Learning in South LA, giving uh, kids a great opportunity and be clear, giving USC a big opportunity to tap into this pool of talented young black and Latino kids from South LA. Yeah. Second legacy is this tremendous social movement organizing infrastructure of which immigrants are a part, labor unions are a part, uh, the folks working against police violence are a part, the Black Worker Center is a part, the faith community is a part. That's a tremendous legacy. Yeah. What I hope will be the legacy, you know, the other day I said something, which is, I love my children. I've got mm -hmm. super cute children. They're 35 now and 32. So <laughs> they're still cute. Yeah. Um, but, my, <laughs> but my children are no better than your children. And I want the opportunities that my children have had to be the opportunities that your children have. And when we make that commitment to all of our children, this region will thrive. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you both for sharing. And I know my thoughts around um, lasting legacy, in addition to the Murray Center, because it's, it's personal, uh, <laughs> and, and the work that we get to do there, but also uh, the continue to see faith leaders rise up. Um, I think that's been a huge part of what we've seen the last 30 years. And I think that's one of the lasting legacies of Los Angeles is this large pool of faith communities continuing to work together, thrive together and build together, build power together and really help shift and shape um, the future of Los Angeles so that all, to your point now, all of our children um, can, can benefit from, the, from our hard work now, the hard work we've seen, and the work that we'll continue to do. So, um, so that's that's the le lasting legacy that I see, and that I have hope for is the faith community continue to rise up, and and now you're seeing faith leaders, you know, engage very heavily with the police departments, with the politicians, you know, with all the various um, in institutions and agencies, right? Um, because that voice of faith is so important, regardless of the of your faith tradition. And so I think that's one of the lasting legacies for Los Angeles. Um, and and um, and I hope to see us continue to do that. We had a couple of questions. I'm just going to answer them real quick. Um, Kimberly asked about uh, is fame doing anything? Kimberly, I don't know. Uh, but if you call Pastor Boyd at First Amity Church Los Angeles, hopefully they will have an answer for you. But I do know all across LA, there's all kinds of virtual events and commemorative events. Um, um, but at Fame, you'd probably have to call Pastor Boyd, but I'm sure he would welcome um, a visit at the church uh, just um, and to say hello. There was a question about what gaps do you see in current scholarship? Um, what are some of the areas of research relating to incarceration? policing and racial capitalism that um, you see needs more attention. Any quick thoughts on that from either of you? What are some areas of research 
relating to incarceration, policing, and racial capitalism that you see needs more attention? Any quick thoughts? Uh, but I'm looking at the time, so the only thing I'd say is come to USC. <laughs> I was going to say that too. We're, I was like, well, we're working uh, on these topics. Yeah, come come to USC. Uh, but there's there's some there's some great individuals at USC who could could dive deeper into that for you, Mohammed. But thank you for your question. Uh, listen, go again, go again to um, crcc.edu. CRCC.USC.edu forward slash LA30 for more about the last 30 years and the work uh, that's that uh, lifts up the work that's happened here in Los Angeles around the 92 unrest. I thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Manuel Pastor. Thank you, George Sanchez. Thank you to the Dornside uh, College and Dornside Dialogues team, Jim Key and everyone for allowing us to reflect and share. I hope that something was shared today that you can take with you and go forward. We really want not just to remember what happened, but how has what happened helped us to be better and continue to be better going forward. I have great hope for LA. This is my hometown. I'm not going nowhere. They couldn't pay me to leave, even though the weather is all over the place these last couple of weeks. Uh, but I love my city and, um, and I know many of you do as well. So thank you for joining us today on this Door Inside Dialogue as we reflect on the last 30 years of the 92 civil unrest. Thank you and have a great afternoon.